Amen. So for those of you who have been joining us for the last few weeks or since the beginning of this year, you know we are in our Kingdom Over Culture series. And it's been really awesome as we've been hearing the men of God who came earlier in the weeks Brother Lewis, Pastor Terrence, um, Pastor Lincoln, to really establish and understand what kingdom is, what culture is, and how God is trying to get his kingdom to reign over the cultures, over our cultural bias, our preferences, and even our norms. And so, you know, we've been really influenced by the culture in our decisions, in the way that we do things, even how we understand things. But God really wants to establish his kingdom. And the thing I think is so, the thing that I think is so interesting is that when we think of kingdom, sometimes we look at it like it's something external like God just wants to change everything around us he wants to change people he wants to change how things are done he wants to change you know the culture of the people but something we need to understand when it comes to kingdom is that in order for the kingdom to be established it first has to be established in you in me it's an inside job and that's what we're going to be talking about today our th- our topic today is going to be the takeover an inside job and so you know a lot of times when we're looking for kingdom to be established like i said we're looking for it to happen in other people and other things and for things to change but there's an inside work that god wants to do on the inside of us to establish his kingdom and that's where it needs to start you know i looked back at um what i was studying i was looking through the scriptures and one thing that caught my attention attention was when Jesus was teaching us how to pray the Our Father. That's like the first prayer that most of us ever learned how to pray. And something that stood out to me is that he said, thy kingdom come and thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. And for me, even though I know it says in earth, for some reason when I thought about it, I always thought it was like on earth, like do it on the earth, do it here. But it's in earth, you know, in this earthen vessel, in this body that was made from the dust. And sometimes we think that it's something so external and God's just like, okay, all the things you're looking for me to move in, the first thing I want to move in is you. And sometimes we take ourselves off of the table because we're just looking around like, God, when you change my circumstance, when you change my financial situation, when you change this, then I'll know that the kingdom is being established. And God's just like, no, you got it backwards. There's something that I want to do on the inside of you. And I thought about an inside job because when you think about an inside job, um, when I looked it up, it says it's a crime (laughs) committed with the assistance or by someone in position or on the inside of the organization or in the group. It's somebody who lives or works on the premise. And so it's just like when somebody does an inside job, they have internal knowledge of the layout, of what's going on, of where things are, of where things are hidden. And that's what makes them so capable of completing the job and sometimes getting away with it. But when you're looking at what God wants to do on the inside of you, he's like, nobody else can do this but you. You're the inside man that I need to help me like move this stuff out of the way. You're the inside man that I need you to show me like, you know, expose where those hidden things are, expose where those secrets are, expose like, you know, all the things that you've been trying to push away and hide. You're the person on the inside who knows where all of those things are so that you can bring God to them and he can take them out. He can, you know, he can remove them. He can like, you know, help you take all of those things that you've been burdening and holding and give it to him so that he can free you. And so as we go through these scriptures today, we're really going to learn and understand how God's kingdom can be established on the inside of us. And it's easy to say, but there are steps to this thing and ways that God wants us to move. And so that's how we're going to be looking at it today. So our first scripture is coming from the book of Matthew and it's Matthew 11 verse 11 and 12, and it says, Verily I say unto you, among them that are born of women, there hath not risen a greater than John the Baptist. Notwithstanding, he that is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. And from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence, and the violent take it by force. So the first thing we're going to be talking about today on how to let God's kingdom be established in us so we can overcome the culture is to repent. And I know it seems like something that's just like, well, duh, I know that. But do we? Because there's a lot of places in our lives that we really aren't repenting. And repenting is more than just acknowledging that you did wrong and then saying sorry about it. The definition that I found for repentance in the Greek in this particular part of the scripture, work with me, y'all, I'm gonna try to say these words, but it's something called methoyana, that's how you say it, I think. Um, But it says a change of mind toward a purpose, one that has formed 
or something that has been done. So when you're really repenting, you're not just sorry about what you did, but your mind towards what you did is different. Your mind towards the position that you're in is different. And when you have a mind shift about certain things, it doesn't satisfy the way that it used to. There are certain things, foods you used to eat, things maybe you used to crave that now when you look at it, you're just like, mm, I can't even stomach it. I can't even look at it. Like it doesn't do for me what it used to do. And when you truly repent, there is a place when you look at the sin you used to be in that it shouldn't do the same thing for you anymore. It shouldn't like it shouldn't give you that same feeling that sh that same desire shouldn't be there anymore when you truly repent because your mind towards that thing has changed. And so repentance, when when I look at it, repentance is actually a very violent process. You know, when in the scripture, when we were looking at it in verse 12, it says the kingdom suffers violence and the violent take it by force. And repentance is truly a violent thing because it requires a place of true brokenness. And when you think about it, there is no nice way to break something. In order for you to break it, in order for you to smash it and get on the inside, there has to be some type of contact, some type of interaction, some type of friction, whether it's something that falls, something that, you know, makes contact in a way that causes things to shatter. And the way that God is trying to break us, there's no nice way to do it. There's no nice way for you to acknowledge. There's no feel good way to acknowledge that where you're at and what you're doing and what you want is filthy in the eyes of God. And that's a hard thing for us sometimes because a lot of the places of sin that we're in or a lot of the things that we're holding on to, we've dressed it up enough in our mind that we feel comfortable with it. It's just like, okay, God, like, I, I repent for my subtle rebellion. Instead of just saying, I'm rebellious, God, and I don't want to do what you tell me to do because I want to do it when I want to do it or how I want to do it. You know, we'll dress things up and be like, you know, well, I'm like this because of my insecurities or, you know, things that have happened to me. And it's not to say that those things don't influence your culture or influence the things that you desire. But when you come to a place of true repentance, you recognize that as much as things have been done to me, there's still an active role that I've played and where I'm at right now. And that's a hard reality sometimes because it's easy to say and to look at all the odds that have been stacked against us and use that as a platform for why we can't move forward or why we can't do what God has called us to do or why we're stuck in the position that we're stuck in. And it really calls you to a place of work. It calls you to a place, you know, of acknowledgement that sometimes we're not ready to deal with because if we can acknowledge it, then we we also have to acknowledge that we have a role to play and a responsibility to play in changing. Now, remember when I said this is an inside job, so nobody knows you better than you. Nobody is able to get to certain things the way that you can. And God's just like, I'm here with you. I'm going to walk with you through this, but you have to show me where these hidden things are. And the way that I'm going to remove them, it's not going to be comfortable. I wish repentance was a comfortable thing. Maybe we would do it a little bit more, but true repentance, really changing your mind about some things, not only is it uncomfortable, but it's constant. It's a consistent thing you have to do because every time you move forward, something from the past is gonna come back up. Every time you feel like you're getting further and further away from it, sometimes your mind will take you right back to that place where you were. You'll remember something, you'll dream something, you'll see something, somebody will reach out to you from the past. Things are always going to try to pull you back. And so that brokenness that God is trying to get you to, that constant contact that breaks through those walls, it's a violent process. And the thing I love about this scripture, it was talking about John the Baptist. Now, John the Baptist, for some of us know, that's, that's Jesus' cousin, not like homeboy cousin, like his actual biological cousin. And so he's, he's preparing the way of the Lord and he's calling people to a place of repentance. And the thing that made him so unique was that the call of repentance that he was calling people to was radical and so different than what people were doing. Before John the Baptist, people did what we do. They pretty much figured that I could say sorry. And as long as I do certain things, then I should be good with God and I should be able to get into heaven and get his promises and get what he says. So, you know, I'll do, I'll do all the things. I'll show up to 5 a.m. prayer. I log on to service. I'm at Bible study. You know, if you need me to do something, I'm there. I'm doing all of the things. And John the Baptist was just like, all of the things are great, but your heart is still ratchet and your mind is still messed up and your intentions and your desires are still impure. And that's the thing that God wants to get to. And that's why this 
inside job can be so difficult sometimes because we feel like we've done enough that people should think that we are where we should be and that should be enough for them. And God's just like in this season, this kingdom over culture, it's not about how things look and it's not about how things are done. It's about what's going on on the inside of you because you can do all of these things. The scriptures are full of people who were Pharisees and Sadducees, elders, leaders in the, in the, in the church and their hearts and their minds couldn't recognize God when he was standing in front of them. And God's just like, this is exactly where you are. Like you are doing the things of God. You're coming, you're consistent. And I'm right in front of your face and you still don't see me. You still don't see how I want to move. You still don't see how I want to use where you're at. You're still missing it. And you're missing it because you won't let me get to your heart. You won't let me get to those things that you've locked away under lock and key that are in vaults because you feel like they're more valuable than the freedom that I want to give you than the liberty that I'm trying to bring to you. And John the Baptist, he was very radical in how he did things. Not only was his message radical, but he also dressed a certain way. It talk, the scripture talks about how he wore camel's hair and Basically, it's like sandpaper, the feeling of it and how he had it on his body 24 seven. So not only did he not want to get comfortable in his mind to think that what he was doing was OK, but externally, every time he felt that friction, he was like, oh, yeah, I got to repent for something. Oh, yeah, God, my mind. Oh, yeah, my thoughts. Oh, yeah, God, my intentions, my desires. Oh, yeah, God, that lust that I have, you know, whatever it is for a person, for power, for, you know, whatever it is, envy, whatever you're feeling, he he understood that it was a constant check. And that's what repentance is, a constant check. And there's no way for your mind to change about where you're at while you're still in it. There's no way for your mind to change when you're not getting anything contrary to what you think and what you believe you know, in that situation. And that's the thing when it comes to culture, when you're raised up in a certain culture, like I'm Haitian. So there are certain things that I've always seen that have always been a part of my life because that's just the way we do things as Haitians. And when you meet other Haitians, people who are from the same culture, you can relate on a certain way because you're just like, oh yeah, my parents said the same thing. I wasn't allowed to do the same thing. We eat the same food. And you feel like that point of reference and contact makes it so that, you know, you're good. You have a cultural connection. And God's just like in all that you were raised in and all that you know and understand, there's a mindset change that I need to do in you that you may understand it, but you can't connect to it the way you used to. Like you can't plug in the way you used to. You can't let what you were raised in dictate your future because there's a, an expected end that I have for you that may be very different than the ones your parents expected. Like my parents, and most Haitian and Caribbean parents, you know, there's like about four career choices that you can have that they deem acceptable or that they feel like you made it in America. And everything else, they're just like, how do I explain that to my friends? And does that make money? And that's pretty much all they need to understand. But God's just like, it may not be something that I'm calling you to in the forefront, but there may be lives at stake. I mean, who really is going to be like, yo, God, my parents, family, in my culture, you know, God called me to pastor. And everybody's like, oh, my God, that's amazing. I can't believe that you're going to do that. That's going to be great. For the most part, they'd be like, you know, God called me to pastor. And they'd be like, all right, so then what you going to do for money? Like, what's your real job going to be? Like, you know what I mean? You could do that on the side. Like, you know what I mean? You could do that in your spare time. You could do that when you get to it. But, you know, I don't think God is saying you got to give up everything. You know, he wants you to prosper. There are things that he wants you to do. And so culturally, there are things that we really have to go against the grain. And here, even when it talks about John the Baptist and him, you know, in his position, it's so interesting that in verse 11, it says that since him, prior to him, there was nobody greater than John the Baptist because he came with this force of like, you need to repent. And this is how you get to the kingdom of God. But then in the very next sentence, it says, but the least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than him. There is an understanding for the people who come into a place of repentance and have Jesus that have a mercy and have, a, you know, have a strength that is so different than what John the Baptist was doing. Like he, he did have a radical word of repentance and God wants us to get to that place. But then he also understands that this is where grace comes in. This is where Jesus comes in. Cause when you really look at yourself, how ratchet you are, how crazy you think, it can make you depressed. It could be like, God, is there anything redeemable in me? Am I worth saving at all? But you need to understand that 
God sees all of those things and he still gave his best for you. He still said like, you know, I love you and I want you to come to me. But the only way you can do that is in a place of truth. And that's what the axe does. When we think about the, the armor of God, the only weapon that we have is the sword of the spirit. It's the word of God. It's the truth that comes to cut away the lies sometimes that culture makes you believe or that you've built yourself up to believe. And you need the word in order to do that. There's no way that you can really cut down and cut through the places that culture has built up in you without the truth of the word to establish the kingdom. And so sin really has in infiltrated every area of our lives when we look at it. You know, the way we move, the way we dress, the places that we go, the people that we hang out with. And we find it acceptable because culturally it's just like, well, that's who you should be with. That's where you should be. But the kingdom of God is coming and trying to establish something different on the inside of you. Another definition when it comes to this place of violence um, I didn't give this one, but just like, you know, violence being a place of force and it's inflicted violence. Like the thing is, when it comes to the truth, there's no pleasant way sometimes to receive it. That's why the Bible says offense will come. Sometimes when the truth comes, it's like you being in a dark room and somebody turning on the light. It takes you a second for your eyes to adjust. It takes you a second and it's a shock because you're just like, whoa, I wasn't expecting it to be that bright. And sometimes when the truth hits you, you're like, whoa, I wasn't expecting it to hurt that much. And offense rises up because you're just like, you know, I didn't want to see that yet. I didn't want to acknowledge that yet. I wasn't ready to go there yet. But God's just like, you know, this place that I'm trying to establish on the inside of you, I need you not to run from this place of truth. And I need you to not think that God can establish his kingdom based on a lie. So in order for you to really have the kingdom of God established in you, we have to repent. We have to let the truth come in and filter through some things on the inside of us and help us to recognize like, wow, God, Everything that I've been standing on and believing is contrary to your will. <laughs> Everything that I've been hoping for at times has been like contrary to your will. The things that I've been pursuing have been contrary to your will because I never asked you. I never per like I never prayed about it. I just assumed that, like, you know, this must be it. I didn't engage the word. Pastor Lincoln always talks about that, how sometimes we'll get a word from God and we won't engage it. We'll just take it at face value and interpret it how we want it to how we want it to be. What we think it should mean. God said that I'm going to be in politics. Oh, so I must be running for office or something. Not thinking that there's no other way that God can move or no other way that he can, you know, be telling me or what time frame, when in my life he wants to do it, how he wants to do it. There's a place of engagement, but that comes through a place of repentance. So the quickest way to begin this process of letting the kingdom be established on the inside of you is through repentance, is through truly getting a mindset change about where you are and about who you are and about what God wants to do on the inside of you. Amen. The next thing we're going to be looking at, we're going to move on to the book of Acts. We're studying that on the 5 a.m. prayer call, and we are looking at the life of Paul. And we're going to do verses, this is Acts 9, we're going to do verses 4 through 9, but we're going to take it a couple verses at a time. So verses 4 and 5 says, And he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. Amen. So the second thing that we have to do in order for the kingdom of God to be established um, on the inside of us is to stop running. Um, I thought it was so interesting when I looked up the word persecute and the Greek word is dioko and it means to run or flee, put to flight or to drive away. And I thought that was so interesting. I was like, man, God, to think like, First of all, you're calling us to repentance. And as uncomfortable as repentance is, it will put a run in your feet. It will put a peace out in your, <laughs> in your spirit. You're just like, mm, never mind, God. I don't think I want this anymore. I don't think I want the kingdom of God to be established on the inside of me. No, thanks. It really will. And so here we have Paul. And for those that may not know, Paul, not only was he not a Christian at the moment. He was not a believer in Christ, but he was adamant 
to kill, to make life miserable, to bind and put in jail anybody that was preaching the gospel. Like he, he made it his mission. Like, oh, okay, not only do I not believe this, but because you believe it, you are automatically my enemy and I'm out to get you. So he was making it his life's work to really go and try to kill and um, God's disciple, Christ's disciples and capture them. And so he's on his way with permission from leadership to go and do what he needs to do, kill these Christians, tie them up, throw them in jail, do whatever you got to do. And on his way to go and do it, he has this encounter with God. And sometimes that's exactly where God finds us, on our way to sin, on our way to go and rebel, in the middle of us lying and stealing and doing all of these things. Right in the middle of it, God's just like, hey, why are you running? Like, where are you going? And he says to him, like, you know, why are you persecuting me? And when I thought about it, when I first read the scriptures, just at face value, I thought he meant like, why are you coming after my people? Like, why are you out to get them? But when I looked up the definition for persecute in this particular verse, and it talked about it being a running or a fleeing, I was like, wow, God, I never realized that us coming against you and attacking you because we're just like you know I'm not against God I'm not doing anything that would hinder him I'm not speaking ill of the church or of the people he's like but you're running from me and that's persecution to me the fact that I'm calling you to a place of kingdom I'm calling you to a place of freedom I'm calling you to a place of deliverance and you're running that's persecution to me. That's bondage to me. And that's what I came to set you free from. Imagine how difficult it must be for Jesus, who literally gave his life, bled on the cross and died for us to be free. And every time we encounter him, we choose bondage instead. He's just like, yo, like, so you're telling me my blood wasn't enough? You're telling me like this free gift that I'm trying to give you that you don't want it. But yet every time you come to me, you're asking for it. God, deliver me from this. God, free me from this. God, I'm bound. And he's just like, I want to do it. But you're running. Every time I go to put my hand in it, you leave. Every time I go to touch and expose something and shine light on something, you go back into the dark. Every time we make this plan of this inside job of how we're going to go in and take all those hidden things that you've locked away, you act like you don't know where the key is. God's just like, you're running from me. And so many of us, including me, have some running in our feet. And we can be running and be here. Like, I can be running and be on the pulpit and still be running from what God is telling me to do because sometimes the things that God is requiring for us to do is more than we feel like giving God I don't feel like praying for them like that God I don't feel like walking in that leadership call that you've called me to I don't feel like you know giving in that way why is it what I'm willing to give enough but like we talked about that place of repentance it's violent it's meant to break you it's meant to get into things that seem sealed and locked up and if there is no key God's just like I don't need a key let's break it down let's move in whatever it is the thing that's on the inside is your heart it's your mind, it's your soul. And that's what God is trying to get to. But a lot of us are running. And so here he says, you know, why are you persecuting me? And for Saul, he was just like, who am I persecuting? Who are you? I don't even know you. <laughs> so he's just like, you know, why, why would I be against you when I don't know you? And that's the thing. Most of the running in our feet is because of our ignorance. Like we don't know what God wants to do. We don't know what it's going to look like. We don't know what it's going to feel like. So many people run from healing because they feel like the process of being healed is going to hurt just as much as what broke them. And so you feel like, okay, God, I don't want to do this. I don't want to go through this. And so the ignorance that we feel sometimes is the thing that we're running from. And God's basically saying like, you know, you're in a rush to kill something, but you're off to kill the wrong thing. And I think it's so interesting. Pastor Lincoln always talks about, you know, sometimes we have these negative attributes or things that we say keep us from God or keep us from doing what we're supposed to do. And he's just like, you know, as much as it may seem negative, use it for God. A lot of times we're just like, yo, I'm stubborn, and that's why I can't do the will of God. And he's just like, you're stubborn? Be stubborn. But be stubborn about the things that will take you away from God. Oh, you know, I got... 
I got a sharp mouth. Be like, you got a sharp mouth? Keep that sharp mouth, but use it to tell the, to back the devil up in prayer as opposed to cursing people out. So many times we feel like we have to change who we are and how we do things in order for us to get to God. And God's just like, I can use you just the way that you are. I can use you exactly how you come, but the direction of where you're aiming these things has to shift. Like we talked about first, there needs to be a mindset shift and there's no way you'll change how you think about certain things until you acknowledge that it's wrong, until you repent and say, God, I thought I had it all together and I don't. And it's a humbling place, especially when so many of us, because of our insecurities, are trying to find ways to build ourselves up. We're trying to find ways to feel better about ourselves because we either don't have what we feel like we should have by now or we mess certain things up. We lost certain things and we're trying to build up our self-esteem in the eyes of other people so that we can kind of feel better about it. And God's just like, if you come to me, I can give you confidence with nothing. I can give you a real confidence that will allow you to walk in the fullness of what you're trying to pretend to walk in. And you won't have to worry about losing it or people finding out that you're really not as confident as you portray that yourself to be because it can be real. And God wants to make it real for you. And that's what establishing his kingdom over culture culture is. Culture changes all the time. It shifts. Somebody has a new idea. That's how we're going to do things now. Somebody has a new way of doing it and it comes and changes. And God's just like, but I want to establish you in the midst of a changing culture, in the midst of a changing society. Like I want to establish you and I want to establish it on the inside of you. So you don't have to feel like you got to go with the flow and change as people change. And so I really want to encourage us to stop running, stop running from what God is trying to do on the inside of you. And you know when you're running. As much as other people might be like, no, you're good. God knows, you know, you're trying. God knows that you acknowledge certain things and stuff like that. You know, he remembers when you used to give and when you used to do all these things. And we do that. And I remember when God told me that was the definition of backsliding. When all the things that you used to do for God, you have to look back in order to remember them. There's nothing current that you're doing. There's nothing future focused. All you can do is look back and say, oh, I remember when I used to do that, when I used to pray like that, when I used to give like that. And that's how you know you're backsliding. Because sometimes you feel like, well, I ain't sleeping with anybody. I ain't stealing I ain't robbing I ain't doing all these things and you make certain sins bigger than others and you feel like because you're not doing that then you're in a place of righteousness but God's just like but you've fallen back because your best is behind you and that's all you can look at but you're not doing anything currently or have a hope for anything in the future and that's where God needs us to be to continue to move so that we're striving for the best but we can't do that if we're running away from him so first we got to repent then we got to stop running then we're going to move on to the third thing we have to do, which is verse 6, same chapter, Acts 9, verse 6. And it says, And he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what wilt thou have me do? And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. And the next thing we got to do after we repent, after we stop running, we got to go. We got to go where he sends us. And when I looked up, this Greek definition of the word go in this particular sentence, in this particular scripture, it's the Greek word ace, and it means to move toward or among. And I love this definition because as much as we're running from God, we're also running from his people and we're running from the things of God. And he says, but when I do this thing in you, when I'm establishing the kingdom, when you stop running, now I need you to go where I'm sending you to go. And he's telling you to move closer. And I think that's so awesome because a lot of times whenever we find ourselves in a place of real repentance and, you know, really God is working on the inside of us, the first thing we tend to want to do is isolate ourselves. We want to be like, okay, God, I know I do that. I'll just be like, well, this is all I can focus on right now. I can't do anything else. I can't be bothered with nobody. God's doing the work on the inside of me and I just can't be around anybody else. Because what he's doing in me is between me and him, and that's it. And he's just like, okay, no, what I'm doing on the inside of you, it is on the inside of you, but you're not going to do it by yourself. You're not going to, like, you know, be able to do it by yourself. And, I mean, think about it. Paul is having this legit interaction with God, like, talking to him. He's telling him this is what you need to do, this is working on, like, Sometimes we feel like because we have an encounter with God that it excuses us from needing other people or from people being a part of our process. And we feel like, well, I literally was like in the third heaven talking with the angels and the Holy Ghost. 
when's the last time you saw an angel? When's the last time God came in your room and shone the light and blinded you? But with all his revelation, with all of his access, he was just like, I need you to go and I need you to go to this person's house and this is what you're going to do and this is how they're going to help you. And so when God finishes his, starts his work and he's establishing the kingdom, the next thing you need to do is to move closer. When he sends you to go, he said, arise, go into the city and it shall be told thee what thou must do. He was sending him to Ananias' house. He was sending him to another believer. He was sending him to somebody who was in ministry, in the work that was going to be able to help him in his next part of the process. Sometimes many of us get stuck right here. We've repented. Our mind has changed. You know, we're, we're ready to go. We stopped running from God. But now that he wants you to go through your process in front of other people, this is where you're just like, mm, I can't do that. I don't really want to talk to them. I don't really want to deal with them. You know, I know you're not sending me to that person to come help me when they was just messing up in this area the other day. And the, the crazy thing is, it's just like God's like, who better qualified? Who better qualified to help you, to walk with you through things, to have encouragement and sympathy and like, you know, really encourage you to move forward than somebody who's been where you are and understands where you are. And it's the same way that God's going to use you once he delivers you and gets you out in somebody else's life. And so, you know, we always talk about the scriptures about how we don't have a God who wasn't touched with our like, you know, touch with our infirmities. He understands what we've been through because he was there. But when we see people who are where we who were where we are right now we disqualify them because we just run through the gamut of why they're not qualified to do it but God was like who better than somebody who knows exactly what you're going through and had to go through the same process and can walk you out or can give you a word or can help you and we shut it down sometimes because we don't want to move closer and you can tell how far you're running from God by how resistant you are to coming close to his people, how resistant you are to coming close to the things of God. It's just like, okay, I love you, God, but I can't stand the saints. He was like, really? Because I'm with them. I'm doing it on the inside of them too. You want the world. You want the culture. You want the thing that's constantly changing, that has no um, loyalty to you because you think it looks good or you think that that's where, you know, you'll be accepted. And it's funny because we use the culture and the world so much as an excuse to really just sin ourselves. You know, I don't want to be, you know, I don't want to be that person who, you know, looks down on people who do drugs and stuff like that. But it's just because you want to do drugs yourself. So you want to be around people who are doing it also. <laughs> you know, there's a lot of times we use the excuse of wanting to be culturally sensitive or, you know, to love people just to get out and express something that's already on the inside of us. And God's just like, no, I need you to go towards the people who are living righteous so that when you're around the people who aren't living righteous, that you don't feel like you need to do it as well in order to, to, you know, to draw them. And the truth of the matter is when you find yourself around people who ain't living nothing for God, you're not talking about God either. It's not like you're going into the strip club like, oh my gosh, hey, diamond, I just wanted to give you a scripture. You know, like there's nothing about God when you're in these atmospheres. But when God calls you to be around a fellowship of believers, around people who are giving you the word, who are talking about the word, who are trying and striving to live a certain way, you feel like, well, I can't do that. And the truth of the matter is we don't feel judged because people are judging us. We feel judged because the truth is hitting us and it's a truth that we refuse to accept. God's just like, I tried to deal with that with you when I called you to pray, when I was trying to fellowship with you, but you didn't want to hear it. And so now that you're in the community of believers, you feel like everybody's looking down on you. But the truth is, is just they're not doing what it is that you really want to do. So now you're just like, OK, well, I don't fit in there. You know, I, it's going against my culture. It's not what I feel like I'm supposed to be doing. And God's like, I'm trying to establish something on the inside of you. But in order for me to do that, you have to repent. You have to stop running and you have to get closer. You have to get closer to the people of God, to the things of God, because there's no way that the changed mind that you have that I'm trying to give you is going to be maintained if you don't keep getting the word on the inside. If you don't keep letting that sword cut through some things, if you don't keep letting the truth, you know, kind of illuminate some stuff and like, you know, you don't keep exposing it and giving it to God in prayer. And so I love this when he tells Paul, arise, get up and go to the city. Like I'm sending you to draw closer. As much as you were seeking Christians out, he was seeking Christians out just to kill them and to bind them up. Now he's like, I need you to go and seek them out so you can draw close to them because he was spending so much time persecuting Christ that he didn't know much about him. 
He didn't know how to recognize him. He didn't know what he looked like. And there are certain things that God's just like, you don't know what the truth looks like in this area of your life. You don't know what truth looks like in love because you've been so bound by a lie that it looks like the truth to you. But when I show you what the truth really is, it's hard to receive what you thought was love really wasn't. It's hard to receive like, you know, what you thought was success and prosperity really wasn't because you spent so much time and so much effort trying to build this thing up to be so great in your mind. And God's just like, that ain't it. That's really not even close to what I'm trying to do on the inside of you and what I want to do for you. And that's a hard reality to swallow sometimes. But the truth, like the word says, it'll make you free. And there's, there's, there's nothing nice about it. There's nothing like comfortable about it. It is just like the camel's hair that, Paul, um, that John the Baptist was wearing. It's a constant friction. Every time you move, it's like, oh, that's uncomfortable. Every time you go to do these things, it's like, mm, that doesn't sit right with me anymore. And it's a constant checking. And it's a constant just like, okay, God, help me. Help my mind. Help my thoughts. Establish this thing in me until the mindset of the kingdom is what I'm moving through culture with. We're, we're not called to live outside of the culture, but our mindset needs to be of kingdom so that we can move through the culture. The truth is Christ was a, among a lot of cultural things. Church culture, he was around the Pharisees and Sadducees. He was around people who were in the, in the club, you know, prostitutes, all these things. But he went with a kingdom mindset. And when he went with the kingdom mindset, he was able to go and bring people out. We go with our carnal mindset and we go and we stay nobody's coming out with us we're not even coming out we're going and we're staying in these places but God's like I need to establish this kingdom on the inside of you so get closer stop running stop running from God stop running from his people and and receive the word and get closer to him to his people and to the word of God amen the next thing we're going to look at still acts chapter 9 next verse and it's verse 7 and it says and the men which journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no man. And the next thing we need to do to have the kingdom of God established on the inside of us is listen. Truth is, we talk too much. <laughs> we talk a lot about what we think, about how we feel, about, you know, experiences that we have, but we very rarely actually listen. And I think this is so interesting because when Paul had this encounter with God, you know, the same bright light that bl that blinded him, you know, they saw it too and they were speechless. And the de the definition for a speechless here in the Greek it's called Aeneas and it means destitute of power of speech, unable to speak for terror. And I thought it was so interesting because it was basically like they were astounded. They were dumb. Like there was nothing that they could say about what was going on. They couldn't explain it. And the truth of the matter is when God starts to do some things on the inside of you, it's hard to put it into words. It's hard to be like, oh yeah, this is what God is doing. This is why he's doing it. This is, this is what the result is going to be. And a lot of times you, we find it frustrating because like children, we, like, like they can't express themselves. So the only thing they can do is cry or the only thing they can do is express their frustration. And sometimes when you're in the middle of your process, because you can't put words to it, that's exactly what you're doing. You're crying or you're, you're angry, you're frustrated. And it's like, what's wrong with you? I don't know. I can't even tell you, but something's going on on the inside of me. This repentance is wrecking me. The fact that I can't run to the outlets that I used to run to is frustrating me. But in the place of that frustration and acting out, we have to open our ears to listen. And it says the men, they journeyed with him. So not only were they going with him, they were going with him closer to the people of God. They were going with him, you know, on this journey. But as they were going, like, they, they didn't have anything to say. And sometimes we have too much to say. We have too many excuses. We have too many reasons why about how we feel, about you know, where things are going. And every time we hear something or do something, we feel like we have, to, we have to speak on it or bring clarity to it from our own perspective. And God's just like, just let me tell you. Sometimes I have to go to God in that. I'm like, God, I don't really know what I'm feeling. I don't know why I'm feeling like this, but I feel some type of way. Help me understand what that is. What am I really mad about? What's really bothering me? What's really frustrating me? Like, you know me better than I know myself. And in the midst of this transition, you have to 
recognize that it's an unfamiliar place for you. And every time you move to a place of repentance and your mind being shifted and changed about something, it's unfamiliar territory. And that unfamiliar territory can be scary and it can be frustrating, which is why he's calling you to a place of fellowship. Because some people have either been there before or they're willing to walk with you through it. There are some things that maybe the people who are around me, the people that I fellowship with in ministry, maybe they've never been in this place before, but they're willing to walk with me through it. They're willing to hear and listen with me, to hear what God is saying, you know, to understand what God is doing and just, you know, read the scripture, read the word. There's still a place of understanding that God wants to give you through your process, but you can't get it if you're talking. And some of us just, we just talk too much. And sometimes we just... Shut up and listen. That's all it is. Just shut up and listen. And there's like nothing, there's no explanation needed. And sometimes we're still fighting for that place in people's minds to think of us a certain way or see us a certain way or know that we got wisdom too, you know, or know that, you know, I've done this before and I've done this. But at the end of the day, regardless of what you've done in the past, the reality is we're all right here together now. So in all that you knew and all that you've done and all that you've experienced, it still led you to the same exact place that I'm in right now, too. Just listen. Just hear what God has to say. Just receive the word. Just receive what it is. Stop waiting and thinking like, mm, I wish so-and-so would hear this. I hope they would apply this because the truth of the matter is you're sitting under the same word. So you need it too. There's an area of your life that you're running from that you're avoiding the application of that God's just like, let me do it on the inside of you. And once you get it, not only will you not judge them as much, but you'll be willing to walk with them through it because you understood how hard it was to get there. Sometimes we feel like things are just so easy breezy, like the, the Lord told you to do this. And if God told you to do this, why won't you just do it? But how many things has God, has God just told you to do? And you're still just like, child, mercy, God. <laughs> I'm going to catch you next week, Jesus. I'm going to obey. And we'll go to God and be like, God, help me obey you. We'll literally pray for those things. And God's just like, literally, I gave you breath, legs, and hands. Go obey. There's nothing more that I can do. We make obedience seem so mystical. We make studying so d mystical. We make the practical things of God so spiritual when he's just like, you're asking me to help you do something that is fully within your power to do it. And so one thing that we have to be willing to do is listen while we're in this process and stop speaking over what God is trying to tell us to do. We need to be willing to stand like the men that journeyed with Paul, speechless, and just hear what God has to say and see what it is that he's telling us. And the last thing that we're going to do while God is trying to establish this kingdom on the inside of us is coming from same chapter of Acts, verses 8 and 9. And it says, And Saul arose from the earth, and when his eyes were opened, he saw no man, but they led him by hand and brought him to Damascus. And he was three days without sight, and neither did eat nor drink. And on, this, on our way to getting this kingdom established on the inside of us. Well, another thing, the last thing we have to do is be willing to shut some things out and shut some people out and say bye-bye. I'm not going to sing the song because that makes me think of. But we have to be willing to say goodbye to some things. And here when it talks about saw, the word saw, it means to discover by use, to know by experience, I messed this up, sorry. To perceive by the senses, to feel, to see with the mind's eye, to turn the thoughts or direct the mind to a thing, to consider, contemplate, to look at, to weigh carefully, to examine. And the thing I thought was so interesting in this is that physically, when Paul got up from this experience, he was blind. He could not see. He was walking around, somebody help me. And people had to help him. He couldn't see. And so... When he got up from this, even though he couldn't see physically, he had to be willing to rely on other things and other people to get him to the place that he needed to go. And sometimes we're not one willing to do that. We're not willing to let other people lead us and guide us to the place where the God wants us to go because of who it is. And, you know, but when you're literally physically blind, you could care less who it is. Just take me to where I got to go and make sure I don't run into something or into traffic and get hurt 
on my way there. And sometimes we're more willing to let the enemy run us over or, you know, old things, old people come and hit us in areas while we're vulnerable because we refuse to be led by the people that God is putting in place to take you to where you need to go. God never said they had to be an apostle or a pastor or an elder or a minister to take you to that place. And when you are blind, you don't need somebody with a title to take you to a destination. You just need to know that they know where you need to go and they're willing to take you. And if somebody's willing to take you, go where God is sending you to go. And the thing I thought was so interesting was this definition of Saul. One of the definitions said to discover by use and to know by experience. Some of us need to say goodbye to some things that we discovered because we used them and experiences that we had. And we are stuck on an experience. We are stuck on an encounter. Nobody ever made me feel like that. I've never had a job like that. I've never experienced anything like that. And we need to turn a blind eye and be willing to say that was great, but it's still not the best that God can do. Because if that was great in sin, how much better will it be in God? And sometimes we're comparing things because we expect it to look better. But the truth of the matter is God's just like, it's better because you don't have to lie about it. It's better because you don't have to hide it. You don't have to hide that relationship. So the relationship in God is always going to be better because you're not running around scared that somebody's going to catch you or somebody's going to see you or somebody's going to like have a dream or a revelation and realize that you're in sin because you're living it in a place of righteousness. What liberty is that? There's such freedom in doing things in the light. As much as we may get comfortable in the dark, there's still such a place of like fear or, or trauma or, you know, worry when it comes to these things because the truth is you're waiting for the rug to be pulled out from under you. You're just like, I know this isn't God, so I know it's not going to last, but I'm going to try to hold on to it as much as I can. And God's just like, I need you to say goodbye to some experiences that you discovered through use. There are certain things that God's just like, I never intended for you to experience that. I never intended for you to use it in that way or use that relationship in that way or use that job in that way or to be used in that way. Sometimes we've been used and we've been the ones that are so hurt and bogged down by what people have done and we can't get past that. We can't move forward in that. And God's just like, I need you to turn the blind eye for it. From a, for a moment. And it's not to say that God's trying to take away your reality, your truth, your experience, but you're just like, I just need you to be willing to look at something else for a moment so that I can heal you in this area because your eye is so focused on it, you're so dwelling on it that you can't see the breakthrough that I'm trying to bring to you. Another thing it says is to, is to perceive by the senses or to feel. And that is very difficult for us sometimes when God's trying to establish the kingdom in us because we don't feel like it or it doesn't feel good. And we do so many things, a majority of things, based on how they make us feel. And when it comes to the things of God and the kingdom of God, most of the things that God is trying to do on the inside of us will not feel good. I wish it was like a word that I could come and be like, it's going to feel great, guys. It's going to be so comfortable. It's going to be easy peasy, lemon squeezy, but it's not. And it's not a comfortable transition. And it's a constant fighting, like we talked about with that place of repentance. It's violent. It's a consistent blow to your ego. It's a consistent blow to who you thought you were and what you've built up. It's a consistent blow to like, you know, that self image that you've portrayed to others that when the reality sinks in, like, yo, I'm really not that man. I'm really not that guy. I'm really not that chick. And like, you know what I mean? People sometimes build you up to these great things. And it's still just like, God's just like that really, that really isn't anything. That really isn't even close to what I'm trying to tell you about you and who I made you to be and what I want you to do and what I want you to experience. And so sometimes we have to turn a blind eye even to how we feel because it will not feel good and it is not comfortable. And even coming back and saying, I'm sorry, that doesn't feel good. You know, even coming back and saying, yo, I thought that I, I was really adamant about that and I was wrong. I was loud and proud and wrong. Like, you know, that does not feel good. That is a very uncomfortable thing. Another thing it says in the definition here with saw is that it's to see with the mind's eye. So some things we have to turn um, a blind eye to or say goodbye to are our own thoughts. Sometimes it's not even the situation in front of us. It's our own minds that are going back to the past, remembering certain things, 
cooking up certain things in our minds of how we can make it work or what we can do, chefing it up. You know, there are things that God's just like, I need you to turn a blind eye for the, to this. And when Paul was in this position and it says that he saw no man, like sometimes we have to turn a blind eye to people. There are certain people in our lives that are keeping us from this next place of kingdom being established in our lives. And the sad thing is we know exactly who they are and we know exactly what relationships they are. And we're fighting so hard to keep them because we're just like, God, I want you, but can I bring this with me? Like, you know what I mean? Can, can I stuff this into something that can fit, you know, the when we go, when we're traveling, I know I do this all the time. It's just like, you can only carry a personal item and we're trying to fit all the stuff from a suitcase into this personal item and stuff it as close as we can so that we can get it on the plane without having to pay for it. And there are so many things that we're trying to bring into the kingdom and kingdom mindset without paying for it. Like, mm, I don't want to pay that consequence. I don't want to have to cut that off. I don't want to have to have that conversation. I don't have to deal with that. Is there any way that I can just, you know, squeeze this in there and squeeze by Jesus and you just let me through this one time? And he's like, no, I need you to say goodbye to some things. And so Paul, he was physically blind. And there's something when something physical happens to you that there is always a willingness to do whatever it takes. Like, I mean, for a guy who had been seeing his entire life and to have this encounter and be physically blind, I'm sure it rocked his world in a way that he was willing to stop running. He was willing to repent. He was willing to listen. He was willing to say goodbye to some things because all of those distractions weren't there anymore. And our lives are still filled with so many distractions, so many things that are taking us away from what it is that God wants to do on the inside of us. And some of those distractions aren't even pursuing us. We're pursuing them we're the ones that's just like man let me scroll on instagram for half an hour even though i didn't read my word at all today let me you know go watch a movie and be distracted even though you know i didn't go to prayer today i haven't really even talked to god today but you know let me go do this there's so many distractions that we are pursuing and seeking out and we try to make it seem like it's not that deep or it's not that serious but it really is it really is there are so many things that God wants to do on the inside of us. And we are so deceived to think that we have time. We are so deceived to think that we can get to it when we get to it. And I was just thinking the other day about Kobe Bryant. Who in the world would have ever thought that he would have died, yet alone his child? And there's so many times we feel like, oh, I got a word. You know, God, you're gonna, I'm, it's, nothing's gonna happen until you know, this word comes to pass. But the truth of the matter is Christ is coming back and he's coming back in the midst of every word that he's spoken. And it's going to be true and it's going to be exactly what he said, but it doesn't mean that life stops moving. People, every day you get older. Every year you have another birthday, regardless of whether you walk in the will of God or not. And it's so foolish for us to think that we have time, that we can get to it when we get to it, that when God gives us an unction, just because it didn't come with a shanda and a, and a service, that there's no sense of urgency to it. And God doesn't speak for no reason. Every Sunday you come and you get a word. Every time we are on prayer, every time we get understanding or instruction, it's God saying, hey, it's time. It's me. I need you to do this. I need you to move. And so, you know, when we get to when we get before the Lord, that's why the scripture says there's going to be such weeping and gnashing of teeth, such a place of regret. Even if you do make it in, just when God shows you what your life could have been if you stopped running, what your life could have been if you just yielded to him, what your life could have been if you just let him do what he wanted to do. It's such a place of regret because you're like, man, God, I prayed about that. I wanted that. And he was just like, nobody was standing in your way but you. Nobody was trying to hold you back but you. Nobody was keeping this from you but you. That's why this message is called an inside job. This is the work that you have to do. You have to be willing to go in and do the work and let God into those places that have been on, under lock and key. That he, like, you've been like, yo, God, I'm never letting this out. I'm never talking about this. I'm never letting you touch this. You know, you have to be willing to do all the things that we talked about. Repent. Be willing to come with that face to face with that constant confrontation that, you know, we messed up and we're wrong and that we haven't done it all right. We have to be willing to really come into a place where we're stop, we stop running. 
where we're not running from God or running from the things of God, where we're willing to go and get closer to the very things and the people that we've been trying to keep a distance from because it's messing up our culture. You know, it's messing up what we want to do. It's messing up how we want to flow and what, and like, you know, how we're trying to move through life. We have to be willing to get closer to those things. We have to be willing to shut up and listen and not talk so much about what we want, about what, how we thought things would be by now and all of these things. Because the truth of the matter is, as much as we are complaining, as much as we are like, you know, upset and angry about things, all of those things move us no closer to what we say we're believing God for or what it is that we want. So sometimes we got to zip the lip and just listen and be willing to take instruction by, from wherever it's coming from. And we have to be willing to say goodbye to some things. And this, the truth is, we don't know if that goodbye is forever, if it's for a moment. Saul wasn't blind for the rest of his life. It just says that he couldn't see things in the scripture for three days. But he didn't know that. He didn't know how long his process was going to be. And God doesn't owe you a timeline. He doesn't, he doesn't owe you a timeline. Amen, hallelujah. <laughs> God doesn't owe you a timeline. He doesn't owe you an explanation of how long it's going to be before you come out of this process. He, and the truth of the matter is sometimes that time frame is up to you. It's up to you how long it's going to last. It's up to you how long you're going to wait before you yield and let God do it. That's what I'm learning. I'm learning that it, there's a lot of places in my life where I am stuck and God's just like, when you get out of your own way, we can flow. We can move and be um, easy, pre easy peasy, lemon squeezy like you've been believing for it to be. There's just so many things at times that we are holding our own selves back from that God's just like, once you get out of the way, I'll be able to do that. And so I really want to encourage us today, you know, to say goodbye to some things. Be willing to let God establish his kingdom on the inside of you before you're looking for it to happen in everybody else and in everywhere else. Come face to face with the fact that the kingdom wants to be established in you. Let that be your prayer. God, let your kingdom come and your will be done in me, in earth, as it is in heaven. The word that you've spoken, what you want to do, do it on the inside of me and I'll get out of the way so that you can do it. I'll be a part of that inside job so that you can take over and your kingdom can be established in me. Amen.